Social Ecology and Communalism, by Murray Bookchin, published by AK Press of Oakland, California, 2007. The Communalist Project. Whether the 21st century will be the most radical of times or the most reactionary, or will simply lapse into a gray era of dismal mediocrity, will depend overwhelmingly upon the kind of social movement and program that social radicals create out of the theoretical, organizational, and political wealth that has accumulated during the past two centuries of the revolutionary era. The direction we select, from among several intersecting roads of human development, may well determine the future of our species for centuries to come. As long as this irrational society endangers us with nuclear and biological weapons, we cannot ignore the possibility that the entire human enterprise may come to a devastating end. Given the exquisitely elaborate technical plans that the military-industrial complex has devised, the self-extermination of the human species must be included in the futuristic scenarios that, at the turn of the millennium, the mass media are projecting, the end of a human future as such. Lest these remarks seem too apocalyptic, I should emphasize that we also live in an era when human creativity, technology, and imagination have the capability to produce extraordinary material achievements and to endow us with societies that allow for a degree of freedom that far and away exceeds the most dramatic and emancipatory visions projected by social theorists such as Saint Simon, Charles Fourier, Karl Marx, and Peter Kropotkin. Note. Many less well-known names could be added to this list, but one that in particular I would like very much to single out is the gallant leader of the left socialist revolutionary party, Maria Spiridonova, whose supporters were virtually alone in proposing a workable revolutionary program for the Russian people in 1917-18. Their failure to implement their political insights and replace the Bolsheviks, with whom they initially joined in forming the first Soviet government, not only led to their defeat but contributed to the disastrous failure of revolutionary movements in the century that followed. End note. Many thinkers of the postmodern age have obtusely singled out science and technology as the principal threats to human well-being, yet few disciplines have imparted to humanity such a stupendous knowledge of the innermost secrets of matter and life, or provided our species better with the ability to alter every important feature of reality and to improve the well-being of human and non-human life forms. We are thus in a position either to follow a path toward a grim end of history in which a banal succession of vacuous events replaces genuine progress, or to move on to a path toward the true making of history, in which humanity genuinely progresses toward a rational world. We are in a position to choose between an ignominious finale possibly including the catastrophic nuclear oblivion of history itself, and history's rational fulfillment in a free, materially abundant society in an aesthetically crafted environment. Notwithstanding the technological marvels that competing enterprises of the ruling class, that is, the bourgeoisie, are developing in order to achieve hegemony over one another, little of a subjective nature that exists in the existing society can redeem it. Precisely at a time when we, as a species, are capable of producing the means for amazing objective advances and improvements in the human condition and in the non-human natural world, advances that could make for a free and rational society, we stand almost naked morally before the onslaught of social forces that may very well lead to our physical immolation. Prognoses about the future are understandably very fragile and are easily distrusted. Pessimism has become very widespread, as capitalist social relations become more deeply entrenched in the human mind than ever before, and as culture regresses appallingly, almost to a vanishing point. To most people today the hopeful and very radical certainties of the 20-year period between the Russian Revolution of 1917-18 and the end of the Spanish Civil War in 1939 seem almost naive. Yet our decision to create a better society, and our choice of the way to do it, must come from within ourselves, without the aid of a deity, still less a mystical force of nature or a charismatic leader. If we choose the road toward a better future, our choice must be the consequence of our ability, and ours alone, to learn from the material lessons of the past and to appreciate the real prospects of the future. We will need to have recourse not to ghostly vagaries conjured up from the murky hell of superstition or, absurdly, from the couloirs of the academy, 
but to the innovative attributes that make up our very humanity and the essential features that account for natural and social development, as opposed to the social pathologies and accidental events that have sidetracked humanity from its self-fulfillment in consciousness and reason. Having brought history to a point where nearly everything is possible at least of a material nature, and having left behind a past that was permeated ideologically by mystical and religious elements produced by the human imagination, we are faced with a new challenge, one that has never before confronted humanity. We must consciously create our own world, not according to demonic fantasies, mindless customs and destructive prejudices, but according to the canons of reason, reflection and discourse that uniquely belong to our own species. Capitalism, Classes and Hierarchies What factors should be decisive in making our choice? First, of great significance is the immense accumulation of social and political experience that is available to revolutionaries today a storehouse of knowledge that, properly conceived, could be used to avoid the terrible errors that our predecessors made and to spare humanity the terrible plagues of failed revolutions in the past. Of indispensable importance is the potential for a new theoretical springboard that has been created by the history of ideas, one that provides the means to catapult an emerging radical movement beyond existing social conditions into a future that fosters humanity's emancipation. But we must also be fully aware of the scope of the problems that we face. We must understand with complete clarity where we stand in the development of the prevailing capitalist order, and we have to grasp emergent social problems and address them in the program of a new movement. Capitalism is unquestionably the most dynamic society ever to appear in history. By definition, to be sure, it always remains a system of commodity exchange in which objects that are made for sale and profit pervade and mediate most human relations. Yet capitalism is also a highly mutable system, continually advancing the brutal maxim that whatever enterprise does not grow at the expense of its rivals must die. Hence growth and perpetual change become the very laws of life of capitalist existence. This means that capitalism never remains permanently in only one form, it must always transform the institutions that arise from its basic social relations. Although capitalism became a dominant society only in the past few centuries, it long existed on the periphery of earlier societies, in a largely commercial form, structured around trade between cities and empires, in a craft form throughout the European Middle Ages, in a hugely industrial form in our own time, and if we are to believe recent seers, in an informational form in the coming period. It has created not only new technologies but also a great variety of economic and social structures such as the small shop, the factory, the huge mill, and the industrial and commercial complex. Certainly the capitalism of the industrial revolution has not completely disappeared, any more than the isolated peasant family and small craftsmen of a still earlier period have been consigned to complete oblivion. Much of the past is always incorporated into the present, indeed, as Marx insistently warned, there is no pure capitalism, and none of the earlier forms of capitalism fade away until radically new social relations are established and become overwhelmingly dominant. But today capitalism, even as it coexists with and utilizes pre-capitalist institutions for its own ends, see Marx's Grundriss for this dialectic, now reaches into the suburbs and the countryside with its shopping malls and newly styled factories. Indeed, it is by no means inconceivable that one day it will reach beyond our planet. In any case it has produced not only new commodities to create and feed new wants but new social and cultural issues, which in turn have given rise to new supporters and antagonists of the existing system. The famous first part of Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto, in which they celebrate capitalism's wonders, would have to be periodically rewritten to keep pace with the achievements, as well as the horrors, produced by the bourgeoisie's development. One of the most striking features of capitalism today is that in the Western world the highly simplified two-class structure, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, that Marx and Engels, in the Communist Manifesto, predicted would become dominant under mature capitalism, and we have yet to determine what mature, still less late or moribund capitalism actually is, has undergone a process of reconfiguration. The conflict between wage labor and capital, while it has by no means disappeared, 
nonetheless lacks the all-embracing importance that it possessed in the past. Contrary to Marx's expectations, the industrial working class is now dwindling in numbers and is steadily losing its traditional identity as a class, which by no means excludes it from a potentially broader and perhaps more extensive conflict of society as a whole against capitalist social relations. Present-day culture, social relations, cityscapes, modes of production, agriculture and transportation have remade the traditional proletariat, upon which syndicalists and Marxists were overwhelmingly, indeed almost mystically focused, into a largely petty bourgeois stratum whose mentality is marked by its own bourgeois utopianism of consumption for the sake of consumption. We can foresee a time when the proletarian, whatever the color of his or her collar or place on the assembly line, will be completely replaced by automated and even miniaturized means of production that are operated by a few white-coated manipulators of machines and by computers. By the same token, the living standards of the traditional proletariat and its material expectations, no small factor in the shaping of social consciousness, have changed enormously, soaring within only a generation or two from near poverty to a comparatively high degree of material affluence. Among the children and grandchildren of former steel and automobile workers and coal miners, who have no proletarian class identity, a college education has replaced the high school diploma as emblematic of a new class status. In the United States, once opposing class interests have converged to a point that almost 50% of American households own stocks and bonds, while a huge number are proprietors of one kind or another, possessing their own homes, gardens, and rural summer retreats. Given these changes, the stern working man or woman, portrayed in radical posters of the past with a flexed, highly muscular arm holding a bone-crushing hammer, has been replaced by the genteel and well-mannered, so-called, working middle class. The traditional cry workers of the world unite in its old historical sense becomes ever more meaningless. The class consciousness of the proletariat, which Marx tried to awaken in the Communist Manifesto, has been hemorrhaging steadily and in many places has virtually disappeared. The more existential class struggle has not been eliminated, to be sure, any more than the bourgeoisie could eliminate gravity from the existing human condition, but unless radicals today become aware of the fact that it has been narrowed down largely to the individual factory or office, they will fail to see that a new, perhaps more expansive form of social consciousness can emerge in the generalized struggles that face us. Indeed, this form of social consciousness can be given a refreshingly new meaning as the concept of the rebirth of the citizen, a concept so important to the Great Revolution of 1789 and its more broadly humanistic sentiment of sociality that it became the form of address among later revolutionaries summoned to the barricades by the heraldic crowing of the Red French Rooster. Seen as a whole the social condition that capitalism has produced today stands very much at odds with the simplistic class prognosis advanced by Marx and by the revolutionary French syndicalists. After the Second World War, capitalism underwent an enormous transformation, creating broad new social issues with extraordinary rapidity, issues that went beyond traditional proletarian demands for improved wages, hours, and working conditions, notably environmental, gender, hierarchical, civic, and democratic issues. Capitalism, in effect, has generalized its threats to humanity, particularly with climatic changes that may alter the very face of the planet, oligarchical institutions of a global scope, and rampant urbanization that radically corrodes the civic life basic to grassroots politics. Hierarchy, today is becoming as pronounced an issue as class, as witness the extent to which many social analyses have singled out managers, bureaucrats, scientists, and the like as emerging, ostensibly dominant groups. New and elaborate gradations of status and interests count today to an extent that they did not in the recent past, they blur the conflict between wage labor and capital that was once so central, clearly defined, and militantly waged by traditional socialists. Class categories are now intermingled with hierarchical categories based on race, gender, sexual preference, and certainly national or regional differences. Status differentiations, characteristic of hierarchy, tend to converge with class differentiations, 
and a more all-inclusive capitalistic world is emerging in which ethnic, national, and gender differences often surpass the importance of class differences in the public eye. This phenomenon is not entirely new, in the First World War countless German socialist workers cast aside their earlier commitment to the red flags of proletarian unity in favor of the national flags of their well-fed and parasitic rulers and went on to plunge bayonets into the bodies of French and Russian socialist workers, as they did, in turn, under the national flags of their own oppressors. At the same time capitalism has produced a new, perhaps paramount contradiction, the clash between an economy based on unending growth and the desiccation of the natural environment. Note. I frankly regard this contradiction as more fundamental than the often indiscernible tendency of the rate of profit to decline and thereby to render capitalist exchange inoperable, a contradiction to which Marxists assigned a decisive role in the 19th and early 20th centuries. End note. This issue and its vast ramifications can no more be minimized, let alone dismissed, than the need of human beings for food or air. At present the most promising struggles in the West, where socialism was born, seem to be waged less around income and working conditions than around nuclear power, pollution, deforestation, urban blight, education, healthcare, community life, and the oppression of people in underdeveloped countries, as witness the, albeit sporadic, anti-globalization upsurges, in which blue and white collar workers march in the same ranks with middle class humanitarians and are motivated by common social concerns. Proletarian combat ends become indistinguishable from middle class ones. Burly workers, whose hallmark is a combative militancy, now march behind bread and puppet theater performers, often with a considerable measure of shared playfulness. Members of the working and middle classes now wear many different social hats so to speak, challenging capitalism obliquely as well as directly on cultural as well as economic grounds. Nor can we ignore, in deciding what direction we are to follow, the fact that capitalism, if it is not checked, will in the future, and not necessarily the very distant future, differ appreciably from the system we know today. Capitalist development can be expected to vastly alter the social horizon in the years ahead. Can we suppose that factories, offices, cities, residential areas, industry, commerce, and agriculture, let alone moral values, aesthetics, media, popular desires, and the like will not change immensely before the 21st century is out? In the past century, capitalism, above all else has broadened social issues, indeed, the historical social question of how a humanity, divided by classes and exploitation, will create a society based on equality, the development of authentic harmony, and freedom, to include those whose resolution was barely foreseen by the liberatory social theorists in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Our age, with its endless array of bottom lines and investment choices, now threatens to turn society itself into a vast and exploitative marketplace. Note. Contrary to Marx's assertion that a society disappears only when it has exhausted its capacity for new technological developments, capitalism is in a state of permanent technological revolution, at times, frighteningly so. Marx erred on this score, it will take more than technological stagnation to terminate the system of social relations. As new issues challenge the validity of the entire system, the political and ecological domains will become all the more important. Alternatively, we are faced with the prospect that capitalism may pull down the entire world and leave behind little more than ashes and ruin, achieving, in short, the capitalist barbarism of which Rosa Luxemburg warned in her genius essay. End note. The public with which the progressive socialist had to deal is also changing radically and will continue to do so in the coming decades. To lag in understanding behind the changes that capitalism is introducing and the new or broader contradictions it is producing would be to commit the recurringly disastrous error that led to the defeat of nearly all revolutionary upsurges in the past two centuries. Foremost among the lessons that a new revolutionary movement must learn from the past is that it must win over broad sectors of the middle class to its new populist program. No attempt to replace capitalism with socialism ever had or will have the remotest chance of success without the aid of the discontented petty bourgeoisie, 
whether it was the intelligentsia and peasantry in uniform of the Russian Revolution or the intellectuals, farmers, shopkeepers, clerks, and managers in industry and even in government in the German upheavals of 1918-21. Even during the most promising periods of past revolutionary cycles, the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, the German Social Democrats, and Russian Communists never acquired absolute majorities in their respective legislative bodies. So-called proletarian revolutions were invariably minority revolutions, usually even within the proletariat itself, and those that succeeded, often briefly, before they were subdued or drifted historically out of the revolutionary movement, depended overwhelmingly on the fact that the bourgeoisie lacked active support among its own military forces or was simply socially demoralized. Marxism, Anarchism, and Syndicalism Given the changes that we are witnessing and those that are still taking form, social radicals can no longer oppose the predatory, as well as immensely creative, capitalist system by using the ideologies and methods that were born in the first industrial revolution, when a factory proletarian seemed to be the principal antagonist of a textile plant owner. Nor can we use ideologies that were spawned by conflicts that an impoverished peasantry used to oppose feudal and semi-feudal landowners. None of the professedly anti-capitalist ideologies of the past, Marxism, anarchism, syndicalism, and more generic forms of socialism, retain the same relevance that they had at an earlier stage of capitalist development and in an earlier period of technological advance. Nor can any of them hope to encompass the multitude of new issues, opportunities, problems, and interests that capitalism has repeatedly created over time. Marxism was the most comprehensive and coherent effort to produce a systematic form of socialism, emphasizing the material as well as the subjective historical preconditions of a new society. This project, in the present era of pre-capitalist economic decomposition and of intellectual confusion, relativism, and subjectivism, must never surrender to the new barbarians, many of whom find their home in what was once a barrier to ideological regression, the academy. We owe much to Marx's attempt to provide us with a coherent and stimulating analysis of the commodity and commodity relations, to an activist philosophy, a systematic social theory, an objectively grounded or scientific concept of historical development, and a flexible political strategy. Marxist political ideas were eminently relevant to the needs of a terribly disoriented proletariat and to the particular oppressions that the industrial bourgeoisie inflicted upon it in England in the 1840s, somewhat later in France, Italy, and Germany, and very presciently in Russia in the last decade of Marx's life. Until the rise of the populist movement in Russia, most famously, the Narodnaya Volya. Marx expected the emerging proletariat to become the great majority of the population in Europe and North America, and to inevitably engage in revolutionary class war as a result of capitalist exploitation and immiseration. And especially between 1917 and 1939, long after Marx's death, Europe was indeed beleaguered by a mounting class war that reached the point of outright workers' insurrections. In 1917, owing to an extraordinary confluence of circumstances, particularly with the outbreak of the First World War, which rendered several quasi-feudal European social systems terribly unstable, Lenin and the Bolsheviks tried to use, but greatly altered, Marx's writings in order to take power in an economically backward empire, whose size spanned 11 time zones across Europe and Asia. Note. I use the word extraordinary because, by Marxist standards, Europe was still objectively unprepared for a socialist revolution in 1914. Much of the continent, in fact, had yet to be colonized by the capitalist market or bourgeois social relations. The proletariat, still a very conspicuous minority of the population in a sea of peasants and small producers, had yet to mature as a class into a significant force. Despite the opprobrium that has been heaped on Pyakhanov, Koskai, Bernstein etal, they had a better understanding of the failure of Marxist socialism to embed itself in proletarian consciousness than did Lenin. Luxembourg, in any case straddled the so-called social patriotic and internationalist camps in her image of a Marxist party's function, in contrast to Lenin, 
her principal opponent in the so-called organizational question in the left of the wartime socialists, who was prepared to establish a proletarian dictatorship under all and any circumstances. The First World War was by no means inevitable and it generated democratic and nationalist revolutions rather than proletarian ones. Russia, in this respect, was no more a worker's state under Bolshevik rule than were the Hungarian and Bavarian Soviet republics. Not until 1939 was Europe placed in a position where a world war was inevitable. The revolutionary left, to which I belonged at the time, frankly erred profoundly when it took a so-called internationalist position and refused to support the Allies, their imperialist pathologies notwithstanding, against the vanguard of world fascism, the Third Reich. End note. But for the most part, as we have seen, Marxism's economic insights belong to an era of emerging factory capitalism in the 19th century. Brilliant as a theory of the material preconditions for socialism, it did not address the ecological, civic, and subjective forces or the efficient causes that could impel humanity into movement for revolutionary social change. On the contrary for nearly a century Marxism stagnated theoretically. Its theorists were often puzzled by developments that have passed it by and, since the 1960s, have mechanically appended environmentalist and feminist ideas to its formulaic of realist outlook. By the same token, anarchism, which, I believe, represents in its authentic form a highly individualistic outlook that fosters a radically unfettered lifestyle often as a substitute for mass action, is far better suited to articulate a Prudhonian single-family peasant and craft world than a modern urban and industrial environment. I myself once used this political label, but further thought has obliged me to conclude that, its often refreshing aphorisms and insights notwithstanding, it is simply not a social theory. Its foremost theorists celebrate its seeming openness to eclecticism and the liberatory effects of paradox or even contradiction to use Prudhonian hyperbole. Accordingly and without prejudice to the earnestness of many anarchistic practices, a case can be made that many of the ideas of social and economic reconstruction that in the past have been advanced in the name of anarchy were often drawn from Marxism, including my own concept of post-scarcity which understandably infuriated many anarchists who read my essays on the subject. Regrettably, the use of socialistic terms has often prevented anarchists from telling us or even understanding clearly what they are, individualists whose concepts of autonomy originate in a strong commitment to personal liberty rather than to social freedom, or socialists committed to a structured, institutionalized, and responsible form of social organization. Indeed the history of this ideology is peppered with idiosyncratic acts of defiance that verge on the eccentric, which not surprisingly have attracted many young people and esthetes. In fact anarchism represents the most extreme formulation of liberalism's ideology of unfettered autonomy, culminating in a celebration of heroic acts of defiance of the state. Anarchism's mythos of self-regulation, autonomos, the radical assertion of the individual over or even against society and the personalistic affirmation of the all-powerful will so central to Nietzsche's ideological peregrinations. Some self-professed anarchists have even denounced mass social action as futile and alien to their private concerns and made a fetish of what the Spanish anarchists called grupismo, a small group mode of action that is highly personal rather than social. Anarchism has often been confused with revolutionary syndicalism, a highly structured and well-developed mass form of libertarian trade unionism that, unlike anarchism, was long committed to democratic procedures to discipline in action, and to organized, long-range revolutionary practice to eliminate capitalism. Note. Kropotkin, for example rejected democratic decision-making procedures, majority rule is as defective as any other kind of rule he asserted. See Peter Kropotkin, Anarchist Communism, Its Basis and Principles, in Kropotkin's Revolutionary Pamphlets, edited by Roger N. Baldwin, 1927, reprinted by New York, Dover, 1970, page 68. End note. Its affinity with anarchism stems from its strong libertarian bias, but bitter antagonisms between anarchists and syndicalists have a long history in nearly every country in Western Europe and North America, 
as witness the tensions between the Spanish CNT and the anarchist groups associated with Tierra y Libertad early in the 20th century, between the revolutionary syndicalist and anarchist groups in Russia during the 1917 revolution, and between the IWW in the United States and the SAC in Sweden, to cite the more illustrative cases in the history of the libertarian labor movement. More than one American anarchist was affronted by Joe Hill's defiant maxim on the eve of his execution in Utah, don't mourn, organize. Alas, small groups were not quite the organizations that Joe Hill, or the grossly misunderstood idol of the Spanish libertarian movement, Salvador Segui, had in mind. It was largely the shared word libertarian that made it possible for somewhat confused anarchists to coexist in the same organization with revolutionary syndicalists. It was often verbal confusion rather than ideological clarity that made possible the coexistence in Spain of the FAI, as represented by the anarchist Federica Montsaini, with the syndicalists, as represented by Juan Prito, in the CNT FAI, a truly confused organization if ever there was one. Revolutionary syndicalism's destiny has been tied in varying degrees to a pathology called Ivriarisma, or workerism, and whatever philosophy, theory of history, or political economy it possesses has been borrowed, often piecemeal and indirectly, from Marx, indeed, Georges Sorrell and many other professed revolutionary syndicalists in the early 20th century expressly regarded themselves as Marxists and even more expressly eschewed anarchism. Moreover, revolutionary syndicalism lacks a strategy for social change beyond a general strike, which revolutionary uprisings such as the famous October and November general strikes in Russia during 1905 proved to be stirring but ultimately ineffectual. Indeed, as invaluable as the general strike may be as a prelude to direct confrontation with the state, they decidedly do not have the mystical capacity that revolutionary syndicalists assign to them as means for social change. Their limitations are striking evidence that, as episodic forms of direct action, general strikes are not equatable with revolution nor even with profound social changes, which presuppose a mass movement and require years of gestation and a clear sense of direction. Indeed, revolutionary syndicalism exudes a typical Ivriarist anti-intellectualism that disdains attempts to formulate a purposive revolutionary direction and a reverence for proletarian spontaneity that, at times, has led it into highly self-destructive situations. Lacking the means for an analysis of their situation, the Spanish syndicalists, and anarchists, revealed only a minimal capacity to understand the situation in which they found themselves after their victory over Franco's forces in the summer of 1936 and no capacity to take the next step to institutionalize a workers' and peasants' form of government. What these observations add up to is that Marxists, revolutionary syndicalists, and authentic anarchists all have a fallacious understanding of politics, which should be conceived as the civic arena and the institutions by which people democratically and directly manage their community affairs. Indeed the left has repeatedly mistaken statecraft for politics by its persistent failure to understand that the two are not only radically different but exist in radical tension, in fact, opposition, to each other. Note. I have made the distinction between politics and statecraft in, for example Murray Bookchin, From Urbanization to Cities, Toward a New Politics of Citizenship, 1987, reprinted by London, Castle, 1992, pages 41 to 43, 59 to 61. End note. As I have written elsewhere, historically politics did not emerge from the state, an apparatus whose professional machinery is designed to dominate and facilitate the exploitation of the citizenry in the interests of a privileged class. Rather, politics, almost by definition, is the active engagement of free citizens in the handling of their municipal affairs and in their defense of its freedom. One can almost say that politics is the embodiment of what the French revolutionaries of the 1790s called civic easement. Quite properly in fact, the word politics itself contains the Greek word for city or polis, and its use in classical Athens, together with democracy, connoted the direct governing of the city by its citizens. Centuries of civic degradation, marked particularly by the formation of classes, 
were necessary to produce the state and its corrosive absorption of the political realm. A defining feature of the left is precisely the Marxist, anarchist, and revolutionary syndicalist belief that no distinction exists, in principle between the political realm and the statist realm. By emphasizing the nation-state, including a worker's state as the locus of economic as well as political power, Marx, as well as libertarians, notoriously failed to demonstrate how workers could fully and directly control such a state without the mediation of an empowered bureaucracy and essentially statist, or equivalently, in the case of libertarians, governmental, institutions. As a result, the Marxists unavoidably saw the political realm, which it designated a worker's state as a repressive entity, ostensibly based on the interests of a single class, the proletariat. Revolutionary syndicalism, for its part, emphasized factory control by workers' committees and confederal economic councils as the locus of social authority, thereby simply bypassing any popular institutions that existed outside the economy. Oddly this was economic determinism with a vengeance, which, tested by the experiences of the Spanish Revolution of 1936, proved completely ineffectual. A vast domain of real governmental power, from military affairs to the administration of justice, fell to the Stalinists and the liberals of Spain, who used their authority to subvert the libertarian movement, and with it, the revolutionary achievements of the syndicalist workers in July 1936, or what was duly called by one novelist the brief summer of Spanish anarchism. As for anarchism, Bakunin expressed the typical view of its adherents in 1871 when he wrote that the new social order could be created only through the development and organization of the non-political or anti-political social power of the working class in city and country, thereby rejecting with characteristic inconsistency the very municipal politics which he sanctioned in Italy around the same year. Accordingly anarchists have long regarded every government as a state and condemned it accordingly, a view that is a recipe for the elimination of any organized social life whatever. While the state is the instrument by which an oppressive and exploitative class regulates and coercively controls the behavior of an exploited class by a ruling class, a government, or better still, a polity, is an ensemble of institutions designed to deal with the problems, of consociational life in an orderly and hopefully fair manner. Every institutionalized association that constitutes a system for handling public affairs, with or without the presence of a state, is necessarily a government. By contrast, every state, although necessarily a form of government, is a force for class repression and control. Annoying as it must seem to Marxists and anarchists alike, the cry for a constitution, for a responsible and a responsive government, and even for law or nomos has been clearly articulated, and committed to print. By the oppressed for centuries against the capricious rule exercised by monarchs, nobles, and bureaucrats. The libertarian opposition to law, not to speak of government as such, has been as silly as the image of a snake swallowing its tail. What remains in the end is nothing but a retinal afterimage that has no existential reality. The issues raised in the preceding pages are of more than academic interest. As we enter the 21st century, social radicals need a socialism, libertarian and revolutionary, that is neither an extension of the peasant craft associationism that lies at the core of anarchism nor the proletarianism that lies at the core of revolutionary syndicalism and Marxism. However fashionable the traditional ideologies, particularly anarchism, may be among young people today a truly progressive socialism that is informed by libertarian as well as Marxian ideas but transcends these older ideologies must provide intellectual leadership. For political radicals today to simply resuscitate Marxism, anarchism, or revolutionary syndicalism and endow them with ideological immortality would be obstructive to the development of a relevant radical movement. A new and comprehensive revolutionary outlook is needed, one that is capable of systematically addressing the generalized issues that may potentially bring most of society into opposition to an ever-evolving and changing capitalist system. The clash between a predatory society based on indefinite expansion and non-human nature has given rise to an ensemble of ideas that has emerged as the explication of the present social crisis and meaningful radical change. 
social ecology a coherent vision of social development that intertwines the mutual impact of hierarchy and class on the civilizing of humanity, has for decades argued that we must reorder social relations so that humanity can live in a protective balance with the natural world. Contrary to the simplistic ideology of eco-anarchism, social ecology maintains that an ecologically oriented society can be progressive rather than regressive, placing a strong emphasis not on primitivism, austerity, and denial but on material pleasure and ease. If a society is to be capable of making life not only vastly enjoyable for its members but also leisurely enough that they can engage in the intellectual and cultural self-cultivation that is necessary for creating civilization and a vibrant political life, it must not denigrate techniques and science but bring them into accord with visions of human happiness and leisure. Social ecology is an ecology not of hunger and material deprivation but of plenty, it seeks the creation of a rational society in which waste, indeed excess, will be controlled by a new system of values, and when or if shortages arise as a result of irrational behavior, popular assemblies will establish rational standards of consumption by democratic processes. In short, social ecology favors management, plans, and regulations formulated democratically by popular assemblies, not freewheeling forms of behavior that have their origin in individual eccentricities. Communalism and Libertarian Municipalism It is my contention that communalism is the overarching political category most suitable to encompass the fully thought out and systematic views of social ecology including libertarian municipalism and dialectical naturalism. Note. Several years ago, while I still identified myself as an anarchist, I attempted to formulate a distinction between social and lifestyle anarchism, and I wrote an article that identified communalism as the democratic dimension of anarchism, see Left Green Perspectives, number 31, October 1994. I no longer believe that communalism is a mere dimension of anarchism, democratic or otherwise, rather, it is a distinct ideology with a revolutionary tradition that has yet to be explored. End note. As an ideology communalism draws on the best of the older left ideologies, Marxism and anarchism, more properly the libertarian socialist tradition, while offering a wider and more relevant scope for our time. From Marxism, it draws the basic project of formulating a rationally systematic and coherent socialism that integrates philosophy, history, economics, and politics. Avowedly dialectical, it attempts to infuse theory with practice. From anarchism, it draws its commitment to anti-statism and confederalism, as well as its recognition that hierarchy is a basic problem that can be overcome only by a libertarian socialist society. Note. To be sure, these points undergo modification in communalism, for example Marxism's historical materialism, explaining the rise of class societies, is expanded by social ecology's explanation of the anthropological and historical rise of hierarchy. Marxian dialectical materialism, in turn, is transcended by dialectical naturalism, and the anarcho-communist notion of a very loose federation of autonomous communes is replaced with a confederation from which its components, functioning in a democratic manner through citizens' assemblies, may withdraw only with the approval of the confederation as a whole. End note. The choice of the term communalism to encompass the philosophical, historical, political, and organizational components of a socialism for the 21st century has not been a flippant one. The word originated in the Paris Commune of 1871, when the armed people of the French capital raised barricades not only to defend the city council of Paris and its administrative substructures but also to create a nationwide confederation of cities and towns to replace the republican nation-state. Communalism as an ideology is not sullied by the individualism and the often explicit anti-rationalism of anarchism, nor does it carry the historical burden of Marxism's authoritarianism as embodied in Bolshevism. It does not focus on the factory as its principal social arena or on the industrial proletariat as its main historical agent, and it does not reduce the free community of the future to a fanciful medieval village. Its most important goal is clearly spelled out in a conventional dictionary definition, communalism, according to the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 
is a theory or system of government in which virtually autonomous local communities are loosely bound in a federation. Note. What is so surprising about this minimalist dictionary definition is its overall accuracy, I would take issue only with its formulations virtually autonomous and loosely bound which suggest a parochial and particularistic, even irresponsible relationship of the components of a confederation. End note. Communalism seeks to recapture the meaning of politics in its broadest, most emancipatory sense, indeed, to fulfill the historic potential of the municipality as the developmental arena of mind and discourse. It conceptualizes the municipality potentially at least, as a transformative development beyond organic evolution into the domain of social evolution. The city is the domain where the archaic blood tie that was once limited to the unification of families and tribes, to the exclusion of outsiders, was, juridically, at least, dissolved. It became the domain where hierarchies based on parochial and socio-biological attributes of kinship, gender, and age could be eliminated and replaced by a free society based on a shared common humanity. Potentially, it remains the domain where the once feared stranger can be fully absorbed into the community, initially as a protected resident of a common territory and eventually as a citizen, engaged in making policy decisions in the public arena. It is above all the domain where institutions and values have their roots not in zoology but in civil human activity. Looking beyond these historical functions, the municipality constitutes the only domain for an association based on the free exchange of ideas and a creative endeavor to bring the capacities of consciousness to the service of freedom. It is the domain where a mere animalistic adaptation to an existing and pre-given environment can be radically supplanted by proactive, rational intervention into the world, indeed, a world yet to be made and molded by reason with a view toward ending the environmental, social, and political insults to which humanity and the biosphere have been subjected by classes and hierarchies. Freed of domination as well as material exploitation, indeed, recreated as a rational arena for human creativity in all spheres of life, the municipality becomes the ethical space for the good life. Communalism is thus no contrived product of mere fancy, it expresses an abiding concept and practice of political life, formed by a dialectic of social development and reason. As an explicitly political body of ideas, communalism seeks to recover and advance the development of the city, or commune, in a form that accords with its greatest potentialities and historical traditions. This is not to say that communalism accepts the municipality as it is today. Quite to the contrary the modern municipality is infused with many statist features and often functions as an agent of the bourgeois nation-state. Today when the nation-state still seems supreme, the rights that modern municipalities possess cannot be dismissed as the epiphenomena of more basic economic relations. Indeed, to a great degree, they are the hard-won gains of commoners, who long defended them against assaults by ruling classes over the course of history, even against the bourgeoisie itself. The concrete political dimension of communalism is known as libertarian municipalism, about which I have previously written extensively. Note. My writings on libertarian municipalism date back to the early 1970s, with spring offensives and summer vacations. Anarchos, No. 4, 1972. The more significant works include the books From Urbanization to Cities, 1987, reprinted by London, Castle, 1992, and The Limits of the City, New York, Harper Colophon, 1974, as well as the article's theses on libertarian municipalism are Generation Montreal, Volume 16, NOS 3-4, Spring-Summer 1985, Radical Politics in an Era of Advanced Capitalism, included herein, The Meaning of Confederalism. Green Perspectives, No. 20, November 1990, and Libertarian Municipalism, an Overview. Green Perspectives, No. 24, October 1991. For a concise summary see Janet Beale, The Politics of Social Ecology, Libertarian Municipalism, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1998. End Note. In its Libertarian Municipalist Program, 
communalism resolutely seeks to eliminate statist municipal structures and replace them with the institutions of a libertarian polity. It seeks to radically restructure cities' governing institutions into popular democratic assemblies based on neighborhoods, towns, and villages. In these popular assemblies, citizens, including the middle classes as well as the working classes, deal with community affairs on a face-to-face -face basis, making policy decisions in a direct democracy, and giving reality to the ideal of a humanistic, rational society. Minimally if we are to have the kind of free social life to which we aspire, democracy should be our form of a shared political life. To address problems and issues that transcend the boundaries of a single municipality in turn, the democratized municipalities should join together to form a broader confederation. These assemblies and confederations, by their very existence, could then challenge the legitimacy of the state and statist forms of power. They could expressly be aimed at replacing state power and statecraft with popular power and a socially rational transformative politics. And they would become arenas where class conflicts could be played out and where classes could be eliminated. Libertarian municipalists do not delude themselves that the state will view with equanimity their attempts to replace professionalized power with popular power. They harbor no illusions that the ruling classes will indifferently allow a communalist movement to demand rights that infringe on the state's sovereignty over towns and cities. Historically regions, localities, and above all towns and cities have desperately struggled to reclaim their local sovereignty from the state, albeit not always for high-minded purposes. Communalists' attempt to restore the powers of towns and cities and to knit them together into confederations can be expected to evoke increasing resistance from national institutions. That the new popular assemblyist municipal confederations will embody a dual power against the state that becomes a source of growing political tension is obvious. Either a communalist movement will be radicalized by this tension and will resolutely face all its consequences, or it will surely sink into a morass of compromises that absorb it back into the social order that it once sought to change. How the movement meets this challenge is a clear measure of its seriousness in seeking to change the existing political system and the social consciousness it develops as a source of public education and leadership. Communalism constitutes a critique of hierarchical and capitalist society as a whole. It seeks to alter not only the political life of society but also its economic life. On this score, its aim is not to nationalize the economy or retain private ownership of the means of production but to municipalize the economy. It seeks to integrate the means of production into the existential life of the municipality such that every productive enterprise falls under the purview of the local assembly which decides how it will function to meet the interests of the community as a whole. The separation between life and work so prevalent in the modern capitalist economy must be overcome so that citizens' desires and needs, the artful challenges of creation in the course of production, and role of production in fashioning thought and self-definition are not lost. Humanity makes itself to cite the title of V. Gordon Child's book on the urban revolution at the end of the Neolithic age and the rise of cities, and it does so not only intellectually and aesthetically, but by expanding human needs as well as the productive methods for satisfying them. We discover ourselves, our potentialities and their actualization, through creative and useful work that not only transforms the natural world but leads to our self-formation and self-definition. We must also avoid the parochialism and ultimately the desires for proprietorship that have afflicted so many self-managed enterprises, such as the collectives in the Russian and Spanish revolutions. Not enough has been written about the drift among many socialistic self-managed enterprises, even under the red and red and black flags, respectively, of revolutionary Russia and revolutionary Spain, toward forms of collective capitalism that ultimately led many of these concerns to compete with one another for raw materials and markets. Note. For one such discussion, see Murray Bookchin, The Ghost of Anarcho-Syndicalism. Anarchist Studies Volume 1, Number 1, Spring 1993. End note. Most importantly in communalist political life, workers of different occupations would take their seats in popular assemblies not as workers, printers, plumbers, foundry workers, and the like, with special occupational interests to advance, but as citizens, 
whose overriding concern should be the general interest of the society in which they live. Citizens should be freed of their particularistic identity as workers, specialists, and individuals concerned primarily with their own particularistic interests. Municipal life should become a school for the formation of citizens, both by absorbing new citizens and by educating the young, while the assemblies themselves should function not only as permanent decision-making institutions but as arenas for educating the people in handling complex civic and regional affairs. Note. One of the great tragedies of the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the Spanish Revolution of 1936 was the failure of the masses to acquire more than the scantiest knowledge of social logistics and the complex interlinkages involved in providing for the necessities of life in a modern society. Inasmuch as those who had the expertise involved in managing productive enterprises and in making cities functional were supporters of the old regime, workers were in fact unable to actually take over the full control of factories. They were obliged instead to depend on bourgeois specialists to operate them, individuals who steadily made them the victims of a technocratic elite. End note. In a communalist way of life, conventional economics, with its focus on prices and scarce resources, would be replaced by ethics, with its concern for human needs and the good life. Human solidarity, or philia, as the Greeks called it, would replace material gain and egotism. Municipal assemblies would become not only vital arenas for civic life and decision-making but centers where the shadowy world of economic logistics, properly coordinated production, and civic operations would be demystified and open to the scrutiny and participation of the citizenry as a whole. The emergence of the new citizen would mark a transcendence of the particularistic class being of traditional socialism and the formation of the new man which the Russian revolutionaries hoped they could eventually achieve. Humanity would now be able to rise to the universal state of consciousness and rationality that the great utopians of the 19th century and the Marxists hoped their efforts would create opening the way to humanity's fulfillment as a species that embodies reason rather than material interest and that affords material post-scarcity rather than an austere harmony enforced by a morality of scarcity and material deprivation. Note. I have previously discussed this transformation of workers from mere class beings into citizens, among other places, in From Urbanization to Cities, 1987, reprinted by London, Castle, 1995, and in Workers and the Peace Movement, 1983, published in The Modern Crisis, Montreal, Black Rose Books, 1987. End note. Classical Athenian democracy of the 5th century BCE, the source of the Western democratic tradition, was based on face-to-face -face decision making in communal assemblies of the people and confederations of those municipal assemblies. For more than two millennia, the political writings of Aristotle recurrently served to heighten our awareness of the city as the arena for the fulfillment of human potentialities for reason, self-consciousness, and the good life. Appropriately Aristotle traced the emergence of the polis from the family or oikos, i.e., the realm of necessity, where human beings satisfied their basically animalistic needs, and where authority rested with the eldest male. But the association of several families, he observed, aimed at something more than the supply of daily needs, this aim initiated the earliest political formation, the village. Note. Aristotle Politics 1252, b. 16, trans, Benjamin Jowett, in the complete works of Aristotle revised Oxford translation, ed. Jonathan Barnes, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 1984, Volume 2, p. 1987. End note. Aristotle famously described man, by which he meant the adult Greek male, as a political animal, polit icon zoon, who presided over family members not only to meet their material needs but as the material precondition for his participation in political life, in which discourse and reason replaced mindless deeds, custom, and violence. Note. As a libertarian ideal for the future of humanity and a genuine domain of freedom, the Athenian polis falls far short of the city's ultimate promise. Its population included slaves, subordinated women, and franchiseless resident aliens. 
only a minority of male citizens possessed civic rights, and they ran the city without consulting a larger population. Materially the stability of the polis depended upon the labor of its non-citizens. These are among the several monumental failings that later municipalities would have to correct. The polis is significant, however, not as an example of an emancipated community but for the successful functioning of its free institutions. End note. Thus, when several villages are united in a single complete community, Koinonen, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficing, he continued, the polis comes into existence, originating in the bare needs of life, and continuing in existence for the sake of a good life. Note. Aristotle Politics, 1252, b. 29-30, trans. Jowett, emphasis added. The words from the original Greek text may be found in the Loeb Classical Library edition, Aristotle Politics, trans. H. Rackham, Cambridge, Ma, Harvard University Press, 1972. End note. For Aristotle and we may assume also for the ancient Athenians, the municipality's proper functions were thus not strictly instrumental or even economic. As the locale of human consociation, the municipality and the social and political arrangements that people living there constructed, was humanity's telos, the arena par excellence where human beings, over the course of history, could actualize their potentiality for reason, self-consciousness and creativity. Thus for the ancient Athenians, politics denoted not only the handling of the practical affairs of a polity but civic activities that were charged with moral obligation to one's community. All citizens of a city were expected to participate in civic activities as ethical beings. Examples of municipal democracy were not limited to ancient Athens. Quite to the contrary long before class differentiations gave rise to the state, many relatively secular towns produced the earliest institutional structures of local democracy. Assemblies of the people may have existed in ancient Sumer, at the very beginning of the so-called urban revolution some seven or eight thousand years ago. They clearly appeared among the Greeks, and until the defeat of the Gracchus brothers, they were popular centers of power in Republican Rome. They were nearly ubiquitous in the medieval towns of Europe and even in Russia, notably in Novgorod and Pskov, which, for a time, were among the most democratic cities in the Slavic world. The assembly it should be emphasized, began to approximate its truly modern form in the neighborhood Parisian sections of 1793, when they became the authentic motive forces of the Great Revolution and conscious agents for the making of a new body politic. That they were never given the consideration they deserve in the literature on democracy, particularly democratic Marxist tendencies and revolutionary syndicalists, is dramatic evidence of the flaws that existed in the revolutionary tradition. These democratic municipal institutions normally existed in combative tension with grasping monarchs, feudal lords, wealthy families, and freebooting invaders until they were crushed, frequently in bloody struggles. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that every great revolution in modern history had a civic dimension that has been smothered in radical histories by an emphasis on class antagonisms, however important these antagonisms have been. Thus it is unthinkable that the English Revolution of the 1640s can be understood without singling out London as its terrain, or, by the same token, any discussions of the various French revolutions without focusing on Paris, or the Russian revolutions without dwelling on Petrograd, or the Spanish Revolution of 1936 without citing Barcelona as its most advanced social center. This centrality of the city is not a mere geographic fact, it is, above all, a profoundly political one, which involved the ways in which revolutionary masses aggregated and debated, the civic traditions that nourished them, and the environment that fostered their revolutionary views. Libertarian municipalism is an integral part of the communalist framework, indeed its praxis, just as communalism as a systematic body of revolutionary thought is meaningless without libertarian municipalism. The differences between communalism and authentic or pure anarchism, let alone Marxism, are much too great to be spanned by a prefix such as anarcho, social, neo, or even libertarian. 
any attempt to reduce communalism to a mere variant of anarchism would be to deny the integrity of both ideas, indeed, to ignore their conflicting concepts of democracy, organization, elections, government, and the like. Gustav Lefrancais, the Paris communard who may have coined this political term, adamantly declared that he was a communalist, not an anarchist. Note. Lefrancais is quoted in Peter Kropotkin, Memoirs of a Revolutionist, New York, Horizon Press, 1968, p. 393. I too would be obliged today to make the same statement. In the late 1950s, when anarchism in the United States was a barely discernible presence, it seemed like a sufficiently clear field in which I could develop social ecology as well as the philosophical and political ideas that would eventually become dialectical naturalism and libertarian municipalism. I well knew that these views were not consistent with traditional anarchist ideas, least of all post-scarcity which implied that a modern libertarian society rested on advanced material preconditions. Today I find that anarchism remains the very simplistic individualistic and anti-rationalist psychology it has always been. My attempt to retain anarchism under the name of social anarchism has largely been a failure, and I now find that the term I have used to denote my views must be replaced with communalism, which coherently integrates and goes beyond the most viable features of the anarchist and Marxist traditions. Recent attempts to use the word anarchism as a leveler to minimize the abundant and contradictory differences that are grouped under that term and even celebrate its openness to differences make it a diffuse catch-all for tendencies that properly should be in sharp conflict with one another. End note. Above all, communalism is engaged with the problem of power. Note. For a discussion of the very real problems created by anarchists' disdain for power during the Spanish Revolution, see the appendix originally written to this article Anarchism and Power in the Spanish Revolution. Available at http www.communalism.org End note. In marked contrast to the various kinds of communitarian enterprises favored by many self-designated anarchists, such as people's garages, print shops, food co-ops, and backyard gardens, adherents of communalism mobilize themselves to electorally engage in a potentially important center of power, the municipal council, and try to compel it to create legislatively potent neighborhood assemblies. These assemblies, it should be emphasized, would make every effort to delegitimate and depose the statist organs that currently control their villages, towns, or cities and thereafter act as the real engines in the exercise of power. Once a number of municipalities are democratized along communalist lines, they would methodically confederate into municipal leagues and challenge the role of the nation-state and, through popular assemblies and confederal councils, try to acquire control over economic and political life. Finally communalism, in contrast to anarchism, decidedly calls for decision-making by majority voting as the only equitable way for a large number of people to make decisions. Authentic anarchists claim that this principle, the rule of the minority by the majority, is authoritarian and propose instead to make decisions by consensus. Consensus, in which single individuals can veto majority decisions, threatens to abolish society as such. A free society is not one in which its members, like Homer's lotus eaters, live in a state of bliss without memory, temptation, or knowledge. Like it or not, humanity has eaten of the fruit of knowledge, and its memories are laden with history and experience. In a lived mode of freedom, contrary to mere café chatter, the rights of minorities to express their dissenting views will always be protected as fully as the rights of majorities. Any abridgments of those rights would be instantly corrected by the community, hopefully gently, but if unavoidable, forcefully, lest social life collapse into sheer chaos. Indeed, the views of a minority would be treasured as a potential source of new insights and nascent truths that, if abridged, would deny society the sources of creativity and developmental advances, for new ideas generally emerge from inspired minorities that gradually gain the centrality they deserve at a given time and place, until, again, they too are challenged as the conventional wisdom of a period that is beginning to pass away and requires new, minority, views to replace frozen. Orthodoxies. 
the need for organization and education. It remains to ask, how are we to achieve this rational society? One anarchist writer would have it that the good society, or a true natural disposition of affairs, including a natural man, exists beneath the oppressive burdens of civilization like fertile soil beneath the snow. It follows from this mentality that all we are obliged to do to achieve the good society is to somehow eliminate the snow, which is to say capitalism, nation-states, churches, conventional schools, and other almost endless types of institutions that perversely embody domination in one form or another. Presumably an anarchist society, one state, governmental, and cultural institutions are merely removed, would emerge intact, ready to function and thrive as a free society. Such a society if one can even call it such, would not require that we proactively create it, we would simply let the snow above it melt away. The process of rationally creating a free communalist society, alas, will require substantially more thought and work than embracing a mystified concept of aboriginal innocence and bliss. A communalist society should rest, above all, on the efforts of a new radical organization to change the world, one that has a new political vocabulary to explain its goals, and a new program and theoretical framework to make those goals coherent. It would, above all, require dedicated individuals who are willing to take on the responsibilities of education and, yes, leadership. Unless words are not to become completely mystified and obscure, a reality that exists before our very eyes, it should minimally be acknowledged that leadership always exists and does not disappear because it is clouded by euphemisms such as militants or, as in Spain, influential militants. It must also be acknowledged that many individuals in earlier groups like the CNT were not just influential militants but outright leaders, whose views were given more consideration, and deservedly so, than those of others because they were based on more experience, knowledge, and wisdom, as well as the psychological traits that were needed to provide effective guidance. A serious libertarian approach to leadership would indeed acknowledge the reality and crucial importance of leaders, all the more to establish the greatly needed formal structures and regulations that can effectively control and modify the activities of leaders and recall them when the membership decides their respect is being misused or when leadership becomes an exercise in the abusive exercise of power. A libertarian municipalist movement should function, not with the adherence of flippant and tentative members, but with people who have been schooled in the movement's ideas, procedures, and activities. They should, in effect, demonstrate a serious commitment to their organization, an organization whose structure is laid out explicitly in a formal constitution and appropriate bylaws. Without a democratically formulated and approved institutional framework whose members and leaders can be held accountable, clearly articulated standards of responsibility cease to exist. Indeed, it is precisely when a membership is no longer responsible to its constitutional and regulatory provisions that authoritarianism develops and eventually leads to the movement's immolation. Freedom from authoritarianism can best be assured only by the clear, concise, and detailed allocation of power, not by pretensions that power and leadership are forms of rule or by libertarian metaphors that conceal their reality. It has been precisely when an organization fails to articulate these regulatory details that the conditions emerge for its degeneration and decay. Ironically no stratum has been more insistent in demanding its freedom to exercise its will against regulation than chiefs, monarchs, nobles, and the bourgeoisie, similarly even well-meaning anarchists have seen individual autonomy as the true expression of freedom from the artificialities of civilization. In the realm of true freedom, that is, freedom that has been actualized as the result of consciousness, knowledge, and necessity, to know what we can and cannot do is more cleanly honest and true to reality than to avert the responsibility of knowing the limits of the lived world. Said a very wise man more than a century and a half ago, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. Creating a new left The need for the international left to advance courageously beyond a Marxist, anarchist, syndicalist, or vague socialist framework toward a communalist framework is particularly compelling today. Rarely in the history of leftist political ideas have ideologies been so wildly and irresponsibly muddled, rarely has ideology itself been so disparaged, 
rarely has the cry for unity, on any terms been heard with such desperation. To be sure, the various tendencies that oppose capitalism should indeed unite around efforts to discredit and ultimately efface the market system. To such ends, unity is an invaluable desideratum, a united front of the entire left is needed in order to counter the entrenched system, indeed, culture of commodity production and exchange, and to defend the residual rights that the masses have won in earlier struggles against oppressive governments and social systems. The urgency of this need, however, does not require movement participants to abandon mutual criticism, or to stifle their criticism of the authoritarian traits present in anti-capitalist organizations. Least of all does it require them to compromise the integrity and identity of their various programs. The vast majority of participants in today's movement are inexperienced young radicals who have come of age in an era of postmodernist relativism. As a consequence, the movement is marked by a chilling eclecticism, in which tentative opinions are chaotically mismarried to ideals that should rest on soundly objective premises. Note. I should note that by objective I do not refer merely to existential entities and events but also to potentialities that can be rationally conceived, nurtured, and in time actualized into what we would narrowly call realities. If mere substantial eddy were all that the term objective meant, no ideal or promise of freedom would be an objectively valid goal unless it existed under our very noses. End note. In a milieu where the clear expression of ideas is not valued and terms are inappropriately used, and where argumentation is disparaged as aggressive and, worse divisive, it becomes difficult to formulate ideas in the crucible of debate. Ideas grow and mature best, in fact, not in the silence and controlled humidity of an ideological nursery, but in the tumult of dispute and mutual criticism. Following revolutionary socialist practices of the past, communalists would try to formulate a minimum program that calls for satisfaction of the immediate concerns of the masses, such as improved wages and shelter or adequate park space and transportation. This minimum program would aim to satisfy the most elemental needs of the masses, to improve their access to the resources that make daily life tolerable. The maximum program, by contrast, would present an image of what human life could be like under libertarian socialism, at least as far as such a society is foreseeable in a world that is continually changing under the impact of seemingly unending industrial revolutions. Even more, however, communalists would see their program and practice as a process. Indeed, a transitional program in which each new demand provides the springboard for escalating demands that lead toward more radical and eventually revolutionary demands. One of the most striking examples of a transitional demand was the programmatic call in the late 19th century by the Second International for a popular militia to replace a professional army. In still other cases, revolutionary socialists demanded that railroads be publicly owned, or, as revolutionary syndicalists might have demanded, be controlled by railroad workers, rather than privately owned and operated. None of these demands were in themselves revolutionary but they opened pathways, politically, to revolutionary forms of ownership and operation, which, in turn, could be escalated to achieve the movement's maximum program. Others might criticize such step-by-step -step endeavors as reformist, but communalists do not contend that a communalist society can be legislated into existence. What these demands try to achieve, in the short term, are new rules of engagement between the people and capital, rules that are all the more needed at a time when direct action is being confused with protests of mere events whose agenda is set entirely by the ruling classes. On the whole communalism is trying to rescue a realm of public action and discourse that is either disappearing or that is being reduced to often meaningless engagements with the police, or to street theater that, however artfully, reduces serious issues to simplistic performances that have no instructive influence. By contrast, communalists try to build lasting organizations and institutions that can play a socially transformative role in the real world. Significantly communalists do not hesitate to run candidates in municipal elections who, if elected, would use what real power their offices confer to legislate popular assemblies into existence. These assemblies, in turn, would have the power ultimately to create effective forms of town meeting government. 
Inasmuch as the emergence of the city, and city councils, long preceded the emergence of class society, councils based on popular assemblies are not inherently statist organs, and to participate seriously in municipal elections countervails reformist socialist attempts to elect statist delegates by offering the historic libertarian vision of municipal confederations as a practical, combative, and politically credible popular alternative to state power. Indeed, communalist candidacies, which explicitly denounce parliamentary candidacies as opportunist, keep alive the debate over how libertarian socialism can be achieved, a debate that has been languishing for years. There should be no self-deception about the opportunities that exist as a means of transforming our existing irrational society into a rational one. Our choices on how to transform the existing society are still on the table of history and are faced with immense problems. But unless present and future generations are beaten into complete submission by a culture based on queasy calculation as well as by police with tear gas and water cannons, we cannot desist from fighting for what freedoms we have and try to expand them into a free society wherever the opportunity to do so emerges. At any rate we now know, in the light of all the weaponry and means of ecological destruction that are at hand, that the need for radical change cannot be indefinitely deferred. What is clear is that human beings are much too intelligent not to have a rational society, the most serious question we face is whether they are rational enough to achieve one.